this is an hour of frames. It's a way of and inscribing after I did my identity or something in a very precise drawings, way sort of so that somebody else gets this piece of paper and says, what is this for me was what it felt like to work at that place. In other words, if you peel away that benevolent veneer of corporate culture, just one little veil away, what I saw or felt was this kind of malevolent, hyper-competitive, money-grubbing, boring, banal evil, if you will. And I turned it into a book of drawings called Make Time for Tom. Uh, Tom refers to Tom Cruise, by the way. <laughs> and it, this, is, this is stupid, but I thought what people did at this boring company was they did all this work, they were bored out of their minds, so they had to do things to pacify them, right? And so I came up with this idea for a lifestyle magazine wrapped around Tom Cruise's lifestyle called Tom, right? Just like, um, isn't there a magazine called Rachel, based on Rachel Ray? I mean, look at these lifestyle, ma or GQ or anything like Oprah. that. Oprah. Is there, that, that's called O, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so it's sort of wrapped around the whole idea of Oprah Winfrey. She, she encompasses an ideal. And Tom Cruise has a really banal, I guess. I mean, I don't know anything about Tom Cruise, the real guy, so to speak. But to me, he represents this sort of like just, just generic Hollywood star thing. And so anyway, I turned this into a book. And some of these drawings I turned into paintings. Yeah. So this <clears throat> is a painting that I did called The Enclosure of Freedom. And I just sort of thought that was a paradoxical we got this sort of trope in America where we say we're free and all that kind of stuff. And I thought, after working at that company, hmm, I, I'm not sure about that. And of course I was influenced pretty heavily by George Gross, who was the German Weimar Republic. He was a social realist um, and explored some of the underside of culture in, um, in Germany during, I'd say, the time of, Brett, correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I'm thinking sort of World War I and into <coughs> World War II, and then he went to the States, and he got sort of, uh, didn't he do landscapes or something really boring after that? And then he fell, he fell down a flight of stairs and died. <laughs> <laughs> right, this brings us to 2008, and two very significant things happened that year. I was fired from this slot machine company. They, I think they were just doing the numbers on me. The guy's not doing anything. <laughs> uh, so let's, let's, we can, that's, that's an easy, uh, you know, savings there. It's true. And uh, my brother, Paul, committed suicide that year. Um, Paul was sort of an amplified um, in a version of me, in a, in a way. He uh, had no means of negotiating the hard-edged world, the hyper-competitive, I'm number one, trophy case crap. He had a very difficult time understanding that. He was a poet and he lived um, from job to job, struggled with alcohol, drugs, and uh, I think eventually he just decided that he didn't have a place in a world where ideas, emotions, relationships are all sort of frozen. You know what I mean? Well, not long after that, I met my wife to be Coral. Coral, right over there. Uh, just right. Okay. And she said to me, not long after we met, uh, you, you're a fine artist and you need to go to graduate school and just pursue this, what you really love, you know? And, and screw this commercial art trap. And so I was accepted into uh, the university's uh, fine art program and my first uh, project was called The Brazen Bull. And so these are just a couple of exploratory drawings that I did while I was just sort of mediating this idea. But let me talk about The Brazen Bull. The Brazen Bull is an ancient execution device. I think it was invented by a Greek and sold to a Roman emperor. And they used to put political dissidents in here and put fire underneath these, um, these big bronze bulls with a trap door to get in heated up, and that their final screams before they died were transmuted through this very complex tubing de device, and it came out kind of as music, as bizarre and grotesque as that sounds. But for me, this was the perfect metaphor for what an American or westernized or a capitalist um, community, society does, is takes all of our expressions, no matter what they are, no matter how 
invested we are in those emotions and transmutes them into this sort of cultural placebo of just sensory stuff. And I thought this symbol was the perfect sort of manifestation of that metaphor. So what I wanted to do was to get, to put on a performance that captured what I considered as uh, Frederick Jameson referred to as rock bottom experiences of body and matter. And I want to bring that and bring those sounds and those aesthetic experiences and put it through that transmutation into that placebo. So I got a, um, an old air compressor to, to serve as a symbol of this brazen bull. But I decided that uh, boxing was something that, was, um, that I got into um, later on. And I've been doing it for about 25 years, but the one thing that I did like about it is that self-determining, testing the limits of your body thing that I was always interested in. And I read a book by Joyce Carol Oates called Unboxing, and she said it is the only human activity in which rage can be transposed without equivocation into art. And I thought, I will stage a boxing match in an art gallery, put it behind a veil, because I wanted the veil to almost symbolize the fact that I didn't want it to look like a competition. Mm -hmm. I wanted to capture the aesthetics of two bodies in crisis. And take that sound, I put a directional um, shotgun mic in the uh, staged area and the sound went through and into the air compressor, within which was a transducing speaker that translated all the sound into physical vibrations. So I thought that that was a way of experimenting with this idea of, of transmuting uh, rock bottom experiences of body and matter into this sort of placebo effect. And this is a still from uh, the first performance of it at the Sierra Arts. I really like this image, it was taken by Kurt Larson, but it sort of captured that sort of aesthetic that I thought of crisis to me in the signifying surface of the body. Um, violence, for some reason, seems to be associated somehow with failure. And failure and violence put together gives you slapstick humor. And um, I just thought that this photograph here of Charlie Chaplin in modern times sort of personify that whole inability of certain people to negotiate the hard edges of industrial capitalism. And I think he was probably making that kind of mistake. Now, Henri Bergson was a philosopher who wrote an essay on humor. And he sort of made the case that the prevailing order, the prevailing fraternal order, if they could not, if you were a somebody who they disapproved of, but they couldn't say that you broke a law and they couldn't put you in jail, they would humiliate you into conformity through humor. So he said basically that humor served in societies as a corrective, okay? And that inspired me uh, for a piece, it was a projection that I did on the IGT, the, it was the Matthewson IGT Knowledge Center. And it's called You Didn't Know That. It is an outdoor projection that in the last two days we projected onto the, I think it's the east entrance of the, uh, the Knowledge Center. Before I explain this thing though, I want to just address the name of our library. <laughs> it is called the Matthewson IGT Knowledge Center. I found that to be one of the most effective pieces of conceptual art <laughs> on this campus. <laughs> because you've got the biggest manufacturer of slot machines. They blight communities. They boil everything into a buck. People are isolated further from each other. And they turn around and as a, je a benevolent gesture, donate to what could be very well the most significant cultural product in our community, a library. And then what's even funnier about it is they decide, I will just die to be in the meeting for this when they decide on this name. Let's call it the Knowledge Center. As if Knowledge is something you can just walk into the door, pay your goddamn money, walk out with your knowledge, put it on your resume, and, so, and go pimp yourself a little bit. So what I, one of the things I was thinking about is I really think they should do this. If, they're gonna, if they've got the cojones to put IGT on that sign, they should put a slot machine in that library. <laughs> but hold on, you pay, you put your money in there, and if you win, 
you get texts from like uh, War and Peace, right? <laughs> or you might get a text from, I mean, isn't that what it's all about? I mean, that's what we're talking about when you talk about knowledge. Because knowledge is a thing, you know, that can be exchanged. It's not learn, teaching people how to think, it's teaching them what to think. Knowledge is a product. So that brings me to this particular piece. And this uh, piece, you didn't know that, was based on a conversation that I had with somebody on campus. And um, I'm a little nervous about this piece, but that's okay, I have to do this. Um, the person asked me, did you know that we had a downtown gallery? And I said, no, I didn't know that. And right away, he said, you are, you're a graduate student MFA, and you do not know that we have a downtown gallery. Do you have your head up your ass? You know, what's, I'm just like, I, I didn't know that. So I thought, well, you've got two people that you would like to think are equitable human beings, right? But this is an example, a microcosm of how somebody uses knowledge. It's knowledge he had that I didn't have to subjugate me, right? He put me here. I said, oh, you didn't know that. Oh, what's wrong with you? There's something wrong with you. So he's here, I'm here. Using knowledge as a, as a form of subjugation. And I think that has perhaps something to do on a broader context with how, I'm not gonna say Western societies, but how certain commute societies in that sort of capitalist model use knowledge as a political pawn, so to speak. So what I did is I recreated that conversation and I played it with a 3D digital model of my head made by a guy named Justin Valvo. And I'm saying, I know, I know, I know. So you've got this overlapping conversation. You didn't know that? No, I didn't know. You didn't know that? No, I didn't know. I know, I know. 